Hello everyone, this is John from RPGs and More. And in today's video, I'd like to revisit the Cypher system and talk about a particular supplement book that I think some of you might find very interesting if you haven't heard about it already. Many of you probably have. Some of you might already own it. We can always hope, right? I'm kidding, of course. It's all good. You like what you like. But this is God Forsaken. What is God Forsaken? In a nutshell, God Forsaken is the fantasy supplement for a cipher system. It takes the basic fantasy rules that are in the core rulebook for Cypher System and expands upon them, adds a few things, adds some spices. It also spends some time telling you how to use them, how to use the Cypher System itself in order to create a more uh, traditional fantasy world for your characters to inhabit. A lot of it does kind of focus on trying to create a, a, a fantasy world that is much more akin to something you might see in a, for example, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. So you're going to see a lot of answers for stuff like that. But there are some other more fantastical elements, and there's they, they do take advantage of some of the, uh, the unique aspects of the cipher system in order to kind of emphasize the difference in play. But let's talk about what's in the book itself and why this supplement might actually be interesting to you because you're like well I'm a, I'm a DM you know I I know how to uh how to change things around I know how to make it very good I can make all sorts of changes you don't need to give me a book to make me do that no we don't that's true you know you you've got your brain is more than enough to come up with a lot of stuff that's part of the beauty of the cipher system it gives you the tools and then you, you can use your big GM brain to do the rest. This is just more tools. More tools, more suggestions, more ideas to kind of help you and guide you if maybe you're not that experienced, you're not that sure of yourself, and you're just like, oh, you know, I'm getting, I, need, I, I want some guidance in this. Or, and, that, and that's good, and that's what, you know, that's what it's there for. So let's kind of go over, I'm going to go over the things that I have tabbed. Uh, because I think that's a pretty good example of what's really cool in this book. So the first big tab that we're going to come to, actually, before we do that, this picture that's in the center <clears throat> its one of my favorites. I love this picture. I think this picture is a great depiction of a multifaceted, highly diverse role RPG party, party of characters. You've got a tiefly looking person or a, a kind of a devilkin type person over here on one side, kind of looking down at the map, gesturing, saying, oh, here's what's going on. They might actually be the quest giver. <clears throat> They might be the quest giver trying to say, oh, you know, I need you to find the MacGuffin, and it's over here, blah, blah, blah. Or they could be, you know, the planner of the party. All right. Um, then we've got a smaller person that is currently kind of just examining a knife in their hand and kind of looking over a few things. And then that could be kind of like, you know, your, your group's You've got a gnome or a halfling in the group. You know, that's kind of like that that thief type person, that smaller person that's kind of going to go into the shadows. Okay. And then there's, you know, a, a slightly pointed eared elf that's also examining that and looking over a book. So maybe they're the, maybe they're the wizard. Maybe they're the wizard. Okay, cool. So we've got an elven wizard in this group. But then we also have a, a cat person that is currently in the process of having some kind of conversation with someone who looks to be like a, a kind of like a half orc fighter type person. So maybe they're goofing off in the corner. 
you know, like, ah, you know, we're not interested in this sort of thing. So, like, the half, the, the half work barbarian or half work fighter is like, you know, like, I'm going to dangle some string and see if I can dis- dis- distract the tabaxi. And the tabaxi is like, ah, I hate you so much, but the string looks so good. You know, who knows what's going on? Anyway, I just, I like it. It's such a great evocative piece of art. And it's in the inside cover. And it's in the back in the inside cover. So you got you get it twice. <laughs> All right, anyway, enough of that. So the first one that I have tabbed here is Fantasy Character Options. Now, the reason why I have this one tagged is because what it does is it starts talking about how you can recreate common character tropes in fantasy games using the cipher system in order to kind of make it a bit similar to what you might expect from the other very popular role-playing game that's out there. So let's look at that. Uh, First one is the alchemist. In the sense that an alchemist is someone who makes magical items or similar types of things, adept and explorer are appropriate type choices for academic alchemists. For a general sort of alchemist who makes potions of magical effects, choose the master spells focus. Instead of spells, you learn potions. For one who transforms into a powerful and dangerous creature, choose howls, choose howls at the moon. For one who loves throwing bombs, choose bears a halo of fire. For a healer, choose works miracles. Those are some ideas and suggestions. I'm not going to go through all of the others because, uh, one, that would make this a very long video, and we don't really want that to be too crazy long. But two, I also, you know, don't want to get in trouble for reading things, too many things verbatim. But three, also, I kind of want to leave some stuff for you to discover on your own. All right, but let's go over what kind of like tropes, common tropes in fantasy games are they talking about? Well, we, they talk about alchemists. They talk about assassins and spies. They talk about barbarians or raiders or berserkers or whatever you wish to call them. They talk about bards, clerics or priests. They talk about druids. They talk about fighters. They talk about inquisitors. They talk about merchants. If you wish to play a merchant, why not? They also discuss monks or martial artists, a paladin or a holy knight or a paragon, a ranger, a rogue or a thief, a sorcerer, a trickster, or a con artist, a war wizard, and then a warlock or a witch, a wild mage, or the standard wizard trope. And the the regular wizard trope is actually the biggest section out of all of these that I have seen thus far. There's a lot of information on that one because they got to cover a lot of different types of wizards within the standard wizard, right? So this section is really kind of cool because what it does is it basically says, hey, we know what you're probably going to want to create if you want to, you know, be familiar with what you've already been running. So these are the ways that you can, these are the rules that we've made that you can use in order to make this thing that you probably are looking for. And we're going to tell you how to do that in a way that you may not have thought of just by reading the rules. It's 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 helpful. It's cool. It's not groundbreaking. It's not going to make everyone go, oh my gosh, I never would have thought of that. Uh, probably not. But it might help you, and it might help your party, and it might be a good selling point. Be like, hey, you know, don't don't even worry about it. We can play Cipher System. I know how to make the Artificer or the Assassin or whatever. Just tell me what it is that you want your character to focus on. What What is the special thing for them? And we will make you an Assassin uh, that f- that actually, you know, fits your preferred vis- vision of Assassin. Or we'll make you a, a, a martial artist that fits what it is that you want to do. And you can use this book as your, your guidebook 
uh, on top of the Cypher System rulebook in order to do that. The, it doesn't add a lot of new foci. It does add some. There are some new foci in this, but it's not a lot. But let's actually talk about that. So there are some new foci that this game, this book adds. And the foci, in my opinion, are part of what makes Cypher System really unique. So what ones does this one add? Well, it adds takes animal shape. So if you want to be a druid that can take lots of wild shapes, there you go, right there. There's your foci. You are an adept who takes wild shape, and then you pattern the rest of your adeptness after nature. Maybe you take a uh, uh, a nature flavoring or something on your in your uh, from the Cypher System rule book. I think nature flavoring is a thing. Yeah. If it if it isn't, then talk to your Cypher DM and say, "Can this be a thing?" And the Cypher DM will say, "Well, why not? Let's make it one." You yeah. know, and you're good. Okay. There's also uses wild magic, wild, wild. So it. Cool. Awesome. Uses wild magic. I mean, wild magic is not my thing. I am not into wild magic. Personally, I can appreciate it. I think it's an interesting narrative idea, but it's so random. It's like too random. And I am a very orderly person. Some of my players probably know this. In fact, they're probably watching this video going, oh my God, really? Um, I, I do tend to do things in a, a very... Uh, I like symmetry. So wild magic is something that uh, it, it kind of, it fascinates me, but I, not in a good way because I, I don't like it. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I don't really, I don't like dislike it. I just don't enjoy it. It's not my cup of tea, but if it's yours, go for it. You're covered here. You got it. All right. Then there's also walks the wild woods. I wonder what that's about. Sounds like they're making a ranger. Ooh. Anyway, uh, Walks the Wild Woods. It's fun. Yeah, my, you might enjoy that. And the last one is Wields an Enchanted Weapon. If you want to play a character where their weapon is really the character, this one is for you. I, I, read, I read up on it. A little bit and I find it hilariously fascinating because it really is like I'm just I just want to be like the, the greatest short wielder ever like cool got you covered bud no worries uh and if and if and if you want to be like I'm gonna play a fighter who's got this chanted sword and I'm just gonna like you know he man my way through everything or or you know, or, or like you know like Tarin when he gets the magical sword uh, in, underneath the ca uh, castle Arwen, you know, and he's like, ah, yay, I've got this magic sword and I can do anything I want. Uh, he doesn't actually get it under the castle Arwen. Um, he does in the, the movie Black Cauldron, not in the books. In the books, he doesn't get it uh, ever. And Well, he does get it later, but it's much later and there's other things going on there. Um, but... In the, in the movie, he gets it, and he waves it around, and suddenly he's this big, flashy hero because he's got this magical sword. So if you want to play that, uh, this, this got you covered. All right, anyway, let's talk about making foci fantastic. That's another important thing. What, and what it talks about is taking foci that don't seem fantastical to begin with, and how do you make them fantastical? Like, uh, it, it talks about, you know, oh, my goodness, Battles robots. Now, that might not seem very fantasy oriented, but it can be if your fantasy includes lots of golems. Because what is a golem but a construct usually made of clay or flesh or stone or metal? which is then animated by magic and you and brought to fight your the party or fight for the party and so now this person is someone who they're used to fighting golems 
and so you kind of you kind of focus in on that one with the foci and, and flavor it towards these magical constructs as opposed to technological constructs so that's really all a lot of it is is kind of giving you guidance on how to reskin things do what you want all right let's go to the next one this is medieval fantasy equipment now this part of the book I find it's uh, probably my most thumbed part, at least when I run my, my fantasy campaigns uh, using Cypher. And that is because what it has done is it, has, it provides you with a very basic, very basic, this is not comprehensive, it's just a simple list of equipment, but it gives you gold piece prices for everything. So instead of the usual expensive, inexpensive, you know, exorbitant cost kind of lists of items, this actually gives you price tags for everything. And I think that um, for those of us who are kind of stuck in the world's famous RPG way, RPG way of doing things, even older, especially older editions, uh, this section of the book is very helpful because it gives you an idea of how thing, how prices translate, how things can translate, and they're really not that far off. So you can kind of take that and go, okay, <sighs> and then run with it. So it gives you a starting point. And it breaks things down from... You know, light weapons to medium weapons to heavy weapons, and on and on. It does also include suggested starting equipment packages for the different uh, types, adepts, warriors, and whatnot. And so if you really just want that part done for you, you can just grab one of those equipment packs and uh, do a couple of small reskinnings of things if you need to, and then move on. Uh, so this also has armor. Oh, excuse me. There's a random weapon table if you need to somehow randomly assign weapons to like, you know, you're stocking up a shop. What does this shop have? I don't know. Let's roll a bunch of D100s and find out. <laughs> uh, you can do that. It's got descriptions of various weapons and things. And then a more detailed description of the armor. More detailed description of different types of standard items that you can pick up. You know, it, it also bits of adventuring equipment, climbing gear, stuff like that. The, the usual stuff. There isn't anything outstanding here or surprising, but it's useful. It's solid. Uh, let's see. Uh, magical rules. So this game system has a several different ways that magic can be brought into the cipher system outside of the average standard how the adept usually works. And it gives some suggestions on how to do this. I'm not going to go through those all in detail because, Frank, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't fully digested them myself, and I would feel terrible trying to talk about something that I am woefully ignorant on when it comes to magic because magic's not my thing. I'm I'm really into, like, the sword-wielding you know, heroic knight in, sh on, in shining armor on the back of his mighty steed with a lance in one hand and a shield in the other. That's my jam. Wizards, not so much. Not really. Like, they're okay. I, I've played wizards. I like wizards, but I don't, they're not my preferred thing, and so I tend not to read up on them. So anyway, so I can't really give you details here, but they are here. There are multiple types, and they do seem interesting. And this gives you guidance on how to and how to use them. So, like, you know, crafting magic items, suggestions on how to make that work with the cipher system. I think that's really kind of cool. I do really like the idea that is uh, talk. I don't know if it's talk about here or later, where basically uh, ciphers, you know, they're one use magic items. So, w how about crafting ciphers? And even if you don't necessarily like the system that they have here. In this book, you can actually probably borrow from Numenera 
and take their system and use it because their system is actually much more robust than what you see here. Um, but if you really just want to like, I just want simple rules. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to worry about it. It's in here and you can pick it up and go for it. Um, crafting ciphers. There we go. Choose a choose the cipher level that you want to make. Determine the materials you want to use. Uh, there's cipher levels and then the material cost. That's kind of a table. So if you want to make a level five cipher, then you're going to need three moderately priced items, or that's how much it's worth is the cost of three moderately priced items. So kind of you kind of use the equipment lists from earlier to gauge how much that ought to be. Then you assess the difficulty of the check in order to create the cipher. And then you determine the time that it will take to craft the cipher. Uh, the assess difficulty uh, between 1 and 10, let's say we've got a difficulty of 4, it should take about 9 hours to craft that item. So that's kind of cool, and that gives you a lot of great, uh, great information. So from there we go to uh, complete the subtasks. So each crafting each cipher is a cul culmination of several subtasks that you got to complete. Uh, and each one of these can be done by a check, you know, by a, a, an intellect check of some of some type. Maybe a physical, maybe a uh, might check as well if you've got to forge it, a skill. There's other different things that, that can be used for this. Uh, and it's all up to how, how you, the, as the game master, want to incorporate this system into your into your game. All right. Um, crafting artifacts. It's a. It's actually a relatively short little two paragraph section, um, but it is important because uh, artifacts are a bit more powerful than ciphers, so do pay attention. But most magic items ought to be single use items, just like ciphers. And I think if you kind of get that whole use them and get more mindset going with Cypher, I think that would make your, in, in some cases, it would make your fantasy much more fantastical uh, because now there's there's magic everywhere. And it's not, it's not just like, oh, you know, we're going to hold on to this magic forever because we'll never know when we're going to find it again. Unless you want to have like the whole like Mad Max, um, mindset of you know we've got this item and this is again this is the only one that will ever ever do this and so we have to hold on to it but we can't hold on to too many because we can't carry that many and so therefore um you know we gotta you know use it when it is appropriate and then you get more but but it's scarce and it's hard to find more magic i don't know you can do both and both are slightly different styles of play but ciphers play into both uh well enough I generally prefer the, you know, throw out ciphers like, not not like confetti, not that much, but, you know, make sure that there's a steady supply of them so people enjoy them. All right. Crafting items, cursed items. Uh, I always like a good curse, you know. You, you, that's one way to have fun with your players. Like, that you, can you can get this item. You can have this powerful item. It's going to do this thing that you want to do. But it's got a price. Power must always come with a price. Personal belief of mine. When it comes to uh, to magic, magic must always extract a price from the caster, somehow. Otherwise, why would anyone be anything but a magic user? If they had the ability. All right. So from here, we've got different ciphers as well as okay you, there's some information about how technology can interact with ciphers so let's say in in this game you've got a modern person that finds himself in a fantasy world and how does their how does a pair of binoculars interact with a cipher okay well you know this kind of gives you rules for that sort of thing oh, excuse me uh, how to how to handle mind control? Ugh. Ooh, yeah, that's that's a thing. Maybe I'm strange. I do not like all of the enchantment spells, like the charm persons and the friendship spells that make it into fifth edition. 
I I used to think they were just fine, but recently, I in in the past, you know, five years or so, I have started to think, you know what, maybe, maybe I don't like those after all. And part of it is because it is forcing someone else to think the way that you want them to think, to do something you want them to do. That's against their against their will. And it seems kind of dubious. I used to, you know, think that, oh, you know, my my, my level one lawful good is gonna have charm, lawful good, you know, wizard is gonna know charm person if they can. Um, because I think that's a cool spell and you can use that to do a lot of fun stuff and you can make friends. And you, but then but then are they really good? That seem like, doesn't seem like a very good thing to do, does it? So anyway, I just I think that enchantment's a little more morally suspect than uh, we used I used to think. Mind control in your D and D game. All right. All right, moving on. Mystical martial arts. There's a whole section about that. There's a section about being possessed by ghosts or devils or demons or whatever you wish. Okay, moving on to the next. We've got fantasy rule modules. That's kind of one of the, the cool things about Cypher's system is you can kind of take some rules as like a set of a module that you can install or uninstall. Put it in, take it out, move it around. Move, put another one in that spot, move things around. It's kind of a neat thing about the Cypher system. You can do that. Uh, you you want to be somewhat careful about it because some things do interact with each other. But for the most part, it's hard to break. You have to really try to break it. So as long as you are being relatively careful, you can move things around. And this section in suggests some different modules that you can throw around and add to your game in order to make it more towards what you want. Uh, for example, it talks about um, treasure and gold. Because typically we don't talk about gold too much in Cypher games. We don't talk about money. No one's going to worry about, you know, do I, uh, coppers, silvers, and gold pieces in the average Cypher game. Or, you know, dollars and cents in the average Cypher game. Because we talk, we just talk about items and objects and purchasing things. Is it an inexpensive item? A moderate item? You know, is it an exorbitant item? Excuse <laughs> But here, it talks a little bit more about the mindset behind having gold prices and having gold be worth something and how you can incorporate that into your game appropriately with Cypher System. Because a lot of people that play that other fantasy game tend to really like the idea of finding treasure chests full of gold. It, it feels good. And you, especially when you're trying to get your players to play a new game, you want to grab onto those things that are familiar, that feel good, and have it mean something. So this kind of talks about a little bit about what you can do with that and how you can make it work with the cipher system. I think it's kind of neat. Um, talks about manifest ciphers. Manifest ciphers, if I remember correctly, those are ciphers that are kind of um, things that you can... Uh, kind of make work in the world. They're not a physical object. They're more like a force of personality idea. You're manifesting this power from yourself. It's kind of a neat idea. Uh, if you don't like the idea of having a bunch of magical trinkets everywhere, uh, then you can simply just say, well, you know, everyone's low-level superheroes in Sarah IV. You know, you get the cipher and you just, you think really hard and for the next you know, act in your next action, you have a plus something to your intellect. Okay, you know, or your your in, your next intellect intellect ta intellect task is eased. You know, okay, those are like little manifest ciphers, and this talks a bit more in detail about that. I'm not going to go into all the details because you got to have something to read. All right. More about artifacts, how to make that work. We have dungeons, castles, and keeps. Uh, how to... It talks about walls. The thickness of walls. What, what's breaking down a wall mean? 
What does that mean in the cipher system? What's some rules for that? Because for the most part, you don't really, you don't really think about that sort of thing too much. So it gives you some suggestions here. Uh, for example, paper thin walls we treat as a level one threat. Okay, cool. If you are in a uh, a dungeon that has paper thin walls and someone's going to be able to just stick a dagger through the wall to stab somebody in the back if they're leaning on it. There we go. Got it. Get it? Got it? Good. All right. Um, traps. How to make traps work in the cipher system. It gives you some advice on uh, how to handle traps. And I think that's there's some good advice there. Definitely recommend that section for those of you who really just love your pit traps or you really love uh, slightly more complicated traps. Go for it. Like, this is, this is good stuff. All right. Um... Doors, you know, the greatest enemy to all adventuring parties, the door, the un, the, the locked door you can't get through. Or is it, is it locked? Is it unlocked? Is it magically locked? Is it mechanically locked? I don't know. So, um, all right. So, and then there's a whole another section here about different fantasy species. And what is what this fantasy species part is about is it's also pertaining to character creation. So, uh, one of the ideas that has been kind of floated around is how do you make your, your dwarven warrior who stands like a bastion different from someone else's dwarven warrior who wields, you know, sorry, who masters weaponry. Well, you've got the two foci that are different, but, but they're both dwarven warriors. One of the things that is, is suggested is, A, you can just lean into it already being done and simply add in flavoring from the main cipher system rulebook, the core book, in, in order to, you know, like, well, this is a mountain dwarf, this is a, a hill dwarf, this is a river dwarf, um, this is a city dwarf, and kind of you use that system to try to, you know, make things a little more fun that way. But another option is to give each character two descriptors with the understanding that one of those descriptors is going to be their species. Uh, and then the, the, I guess the caveat to that one would be, you know, humans might, maybe the human, people playing a human can get, just pick two descriptors of any type because they're a human and that's their one bonus. It's, it's a cool option and it's something to think about, especially if you're one of those people that really just has to make sure that you want a descriptor and then you also want to be a dwarf or you want a descriptor, you also want to be an elf. Um, you want to be the strong elf. You want to be the um, the charming half orc, you know. So that's something to think about. And you don't even need to have this book in order to use that. You can start using that with the standard cipher system rulebook now. But this book also adds in a couple other species that you can pick from, and gives you guidance on how to use the standard ones too. So we've got we have cat folk. We have Dragon folk. We have gnomes, halflings, uh, lizard folk. And of course, in the main core rulebook of the cipher system, you remember, there should also be dwarves and elves already listed. So you just add these to those options that are already there and have some fun. All right, moving on. There's some cipher shorts in here. If you're the kind of person that wants a bunch of sh a couple of short adventures to get your game started, they are in this book. I'm not going to go over them. Um, hmm. There is a small monster manual, creatures and NPCs. 
kind of covers a lot of the the basic common tropes of what you can expect uh, stuff that was that wouldn't be in the core rulebook for cipher system it also gives you a a handy guide of creatures and npcs by level or difficulty level basically and that's kind of neat so we start out with uh goblins and shadows and guards and warlock uh, morlocks and orcs and uh, skeletons wraiths and bards and it goes from there all the way up to a wizard a mighty wizard or a lich or a demigod or a demon lord or a kaiju if you want to have your characters fight a kaiju this game has got you covered <laughs> so, that's pretty cool i like that um, and there's some cool creatures like the basilisk all right i just like that art look at that look at that basilisk that's a beauty that is a beautiful picture oh my goodness this book is full of just beautiful art all all the monty cook games books just gorgeous anyway so uh each one of these entries has a nice bit of art and a full page of other text as well on top of the art there in order to give you an idea of how that creature behaves what environments it's found in how it fights why it fights because that's a very important question in cypher system game is the why not just the how and um and how its special abilities work, if it has any. But this stuff is really important because, in, in essence, a cipher system monster is really just a difficulty level, right? Because you're, you're rolling against that in order to hit it, and you're rolling against it again in order to avoid being hit by it. And all of the, the hit points and the armor is all based upon... Excuse me. It's difficulty rating. But if we only use that information, then it would start to feel very samey after a while. So what, what books like this do is they give you a lot more to flesh out what the basic information is. And I like that. I like that a lot. But at the same time, you never forget that the basic information really is all you need. All right. Fantasy ciphers. So we got a whole section of ciphers here that you can kind of like look through and, and grab whatever you like because they're all designed to be useful for a fantasy world as everything that you need has been done for you already. Okay, so let's read one for as an example. This is the Cold Resistance Cipher, level 1d6 plus 3, effect the user gains armor against cold damage equal to the cipher's level for one hour that's it you can make it look like whatever you like doesn't specify that it has to be you know an armband or it has to be a ring or whatever it can be whatever kind of thing you you want to use as, as a cipher just like in the main rule book okay one last marker here and that is the godforsaken setting because the last, I want to say, third of this book is dedicated to the Godforsaken setting. And this setting basically takes a lot of the rules that we have looked at in the previous two-thirds of the book and then shows you how to apply them to create your own unique setting. I think it's an interesting setting. I'm not going to spoil too much too much about it, but I don't know if I would use it myself because it doesn't it's not quite my cup of tea, but I do enjoy reading it. I do think it's really a neat idea. I've stolen ideas from it already, and I'd say that's a pretty you know pretty good endorsement of a small campaign setting that they've included in here. To give you a, a basic rundown of it, I, if I recall correctly, 
it is um, the gods are gone. They are God for the people are God forsaken, and it is now the time for mighty humans to kind of take up the gifts of the gods. You know what what little bits remain in order to kind of forge their own destiny in a very dangerous world. I think I probably got that very wrong. So no, don't hold me to that. Um, but it sounds like a cool idea. I might that that could be a new setting. Like hey, you know you're here. Here's here's DMs setting idea for you. All the gods are dead. Uh, all their powers are just like they're the ciphers in the world are all like the like when when the gods died. They were uh, scattered into diamond dust, and each one of these bits of dust is a is like a gem or a jewel of some kind, like a diamond that has fallen to the ground, and each one of those becomes a cipher. And so that's why there are so many ciphers in the world, because you know that's all the bits of the gods, and the gods are infinite. So there's infinite ciphers. Really, uh, you just you just have to you quest for them, you find them, you collect them, you use them. Um, and then there's more because, you know, the gods are everywhere and every when. So therefore, you're never going to not find bits of the gods' bodies after they're destroyed. Um, but now is the time for humans. So there's your, there's your god-forsaken setting idea that probably has absolutely nothing to do with what is written in this book. But it's a fun idea. Go for it. Run with it. I have no, you know, no, no rights to it that I'm claiming whatsoever. Enjoy. But... It, within this book, you know, you get a you get a map for this micro setting. You get tools uh, telling you what's available. There's a couple of adventures. There's some cool art. It's fun. Go with it. Enjoy. And in the back of the book, which I'm not going to show you, but it's there. Um, my it's not there on my copy. Be, I, no wait, no. This is this book did not have a map. That's right. This was like the one that did not include. A poster map and I was so disappointed when I realized that um, but anyway that is a quick rundown of the things from the God Forsaken supplement to the cipher system that I really enjoyed and that I think you might enjoy too and there are reasons why I think that uh, those of you who are trying to use the cipher system to play a more fantasy oriented game probably should pick this book up in order to kind of see what where Monty Cook's excuse me, Monty Cook Games is heads at when it comes to making fantasy stuff. Another option, if you're into that sort of thing, would be to pick up the Numenera game. Because what Numenera is, is it's science fantasy, and it has all of the the stuff already done. You don't even, you don't have to do any house rules. You don't. Have, it's just it's all there. I'll talk about those that game in a different uh, series of videos that I'll do about Numenera specifically. But this is just this is more the generic fantasy for the cipher system. That's what Godforsaken does. Uh, so thank you for joining me. I hope you all have a wonderful night and peace be with you. If you like what I uh, did here, please. Uh, like the video. I would appreciate a comment and let me know what went well. Maybe, maybe what did not go so well. Um, that's okay too. I can take criticism as long as it's you know as long as it's constructive. We're all good. All right. Thank you so much again. Peace be with you. Bye bye.